remembrance for the European victims of Nazism and communism known as Black Ribbon Day. Our first symposium that year featured Vladimir Karmorzov as one of our guests, along with Boris Nemtsov, who joined us from Moscow. While we've lived through considerable regional upheavals, the savage assassination of Boris Nemtsov in 2015, and the two poisonings that Vladimir survived, we are now at the confluence of an unprecedented set of geopolitical challenges that threaten the stability of the Western liberal order. And while history is of course important, our focus today will be on these issues, the hope for democratic change in Belarus and the future of Russia under Vladimir Putin, whose rule may yet extend to 2036. Early this morning, we received the terrible news that Russian anti-corruption activist Alexei Navalny had been poisoned and is currently in a coma and on a ventilator. And we know that Vladimir is currently giving media interviews about this and he may be joining us right away. He may be joining us uh, in a short bit. Um, now, to help us understand and digest these fast moving issues, uh, we are incredibly honored to be joined today by two remarkable individuals whose heroic commitment to freedom and democracy has put them in perilous danger and who continue to lead despite the threats that they face for doing so. Of course, Vladimir Karamurza and my dear friend, Andrei Sanikov. Before we begin, allow me to give some historical context to our discussion today. The Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact was signed 81 years ago on August 23rd, 1939 in Moscow. The agreement, like others signed by the Soviets and Nazis, committed Hitler and Stalin to a period of non-aggression. But unlike other non-aggression treaties, the Hitler-Stalin Pact included a secret protocol that carved up Central and Eastern Europe between Hitler and Stalin and facilitated the coordinated start of the Second World War in Poland. The Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact subjected millions of Central and Eastern Europeans to violent repression and occupation by the Soviets and Nazis from Finland in the north and to Romania in the south. When Adolf Hitler redirected his aggression towards these millions of Eastern Europeans, including Russians who had suffered Soviet repression, faced the Nazi menace, mass repression, and the unspeakable horrors of the Holocaust. Thanks to the Allies, Western Europe was liber liberated but Eastern and Central Europe would remain occupied or controlled by the Soviet Union for another half century. For them, the war did not end until 1991. Today, Belarus seems set on a course to finally join its neighbors to become the final nation to emerge from Stalin's shadow and the crypto-Soviet leadership of Alexander Lukashenko. In Russia, Vladimir Putin continues to leverage Stalin's World War II legacy to add legitimacy to his own authoritarian rule. Of greater concern is Putin's emulation of Stalin's tactics, including foreign aggression, domestic repression, and the violent silencing of his critics. For their perspectives on how this history is impacting the unfolding events in the region, we are joined by my old friend, Andrei Senikov, who is a former Belarusian deputy foreign minister and a leading opposition leader and activist. In 2010, Andre ran as a candidate against Alexander Lukashenko in the presidential elections. And in a situation not too different from what we're seeing or what we've been seeing over the past two weeks, Andre was incarcerated in its KGB facility for peacefully protesting election fraud and was recognized by Amnesty International as a prisoner of conscience. After 16 months in prison, he was released under pressure from the international community, including Boris Nemtsov, but soon after was forced to flee the country. He continues his work for a free and democratic Belarus in exile. We can only hope that he'll be able to return to Belarus to continue his important work soon. But first, I'm hoping that we'll hear, and there's Vladimir right now, we'll first hear from my dear friend Vladimir Karamurza, who is of course a leading Russian pro-democracy activist, politician, author, and filmmaker. He was a longtime colleague of Russian opposition leader Boris Nemtsov and chairs the Boris Nemtsov Foundation for Freedom. Vladimir is a former deputy leader of the People's Freedom Party and was a candidate for the Russian State Duma. As most of us know, Vladimir was poisoned twice in 2015 and 2017 and left, like Alexei Navalny, in a coma as retribution for his work on Magnitsky sanctions. Vladimir today is a contributing writer at the Washington Post and hosts a weekly show on Echo Moscow. Vladimir is the vice president of the Free Russia Foundation, Free Russia Foundation and is a senior advisor for human rights accountability at Human Rights First and a senior fellow at Erwin Kotler's Raoul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights. Now, Vladimir and Andre will give some introductory remarks for five to 10 minutes each, and then we'll have a discussion followed by some, uh, by some audience questions. Um, Vladimir may have to leave us 
soon because as we all might expect, uh, the media is very keen to speak to him. So uh, Vladimir, if you have time afterward, if you can join us for the discussion, that's great. If you need to leave, that's not a problem. So I'll give the floor to Vladimir Karamorza. Marcus, thank you so much. It's wonderful to join you even in this virtual format and I hope we get to do this in real life this time next year. Thank you to the Central and Eastern European Council in Canada uh, and the Ukrainian Canadian Congress for organizing this discussion. I remember the very first uh, event in this series was held in August of 2009, uh, which I guess was the 70th right anniversary of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. Uh, I had the honor of um, being president in person at the University of Toronto where Marcus hosted and organized this event. Uh, and Boris Nemtsov was the keynote speaker. He was he couldn't come to Canada himself. He didn't have a visa and it was too short notice to organize. So he joined uh, by Skype, uh, by video link. And every time he would mention the word FSB, which is the domestic success successes of the KGB, Russian Domestic Security Service, the line would uh, would break down. We'd have to reconnect again. So um, uh, after a, a few such tries, Marcus asked Boris if he could use the euphemism and, and, and substitute the FSB with uh, with some other term. So it's wonderful to see that you're continuing this, uh, this tradition. And I hope uh, before long we'll be able to resume this in real life with real human beings in the same in the same person as uh, as marcus mentioned this is a very uh, difficult day for many of us uh, early this morning uh, russian opposition leader alexei navalny was uh, heavily poisoned uh, while on a plane from Tomsk to Moscow. Um, the plane landed uh, urgently in, in Omsk, which is also still in Siberia, and where he's now being attended to in hospital. I must say it's, uh, it, it's been a, a groundhog day for me in the most horrible sense from this morning, being in touch with his family and reading about what was happening because his symptoms and the whole situation is down to the last details is exactly the same as what happened to me uh, during the two poisonings in 2015 and 2017. The, the coma, the organ failure, the brain swelling, the fact that it happened just before a flight, and also the drumbeat of Kremlin propagandists uh, who are who have immediately started shouting that no, nobody's poisoned him. He just drank too much alcohol or took some medicine or whatever nonsense they, they come up with. If you recall, that's, uh, that's a favorite tactic. When Viktor Yushchenko was poisoned in 2004, um, the Kremlin propaganda said that he had a botched uh, cosmetic surgery. When uh, Alexander Litvinenko was poisoned in London in 2006, they said that he was himself dealing with polonium and swallowed it by accident. That's, that's a favorite tactic to try to put out smears, disinformation, all the rest of it. I think the most important thing I can say is that uh, and the most important thing now is to, is to, is to pray for Alexei and wish him and his uh, loved ones strength and perseverance to, to pull through this and, and to, to stay alive and to come, back, to come back to good health. And I have no doubt that as soon as he is back to good health, he will resume exactly what he was doing up until this moment. As you know, Alexei Navalny is the most effective and the most prominent voice today, now since Boris Nemtsov was killed, in the Russian democratic opposition against Vladimir Putin's regime, not only its authoritarianism, but also its corruption and its nepotism, which is the heart of that rotten system. And as you know, Navalny was, um, has engaged in many high profile and prominent anti-corruption investigations in recent years directed at Vladimir Putin's close circle. And I think it's also very important to um, keep this in international spotlight. The reason I'm joined a little bit late because I just talked to Mark McKinnon from the Globe and Mail uh, because he, he called up to, to get my comment on this. And, and uh, I tried to speak to everybody who, who's getting in touch because as I know, and I'm living testimony to that, international attention can save a life. I don't think if I would be, I don't know if I'd be sitting here speaking with you now if, if there wasn't so much public spotlight on my own poisoning because of course it's much easier to commit a crime in darkness than when the spotlight is on. It was, it was heartening to see so many strong statements from the European Union, from Britain, from both sides of the island, the American Congress. I hope this continues. Let's keep the spotlight on together, all of us. Um, and once once this immediate crisis is over, I think it's important to start talking about responsibility for those people who continue to do this to those who oppose Vladimir Putin's regime, Russians and non-Russians, politicians, journalists, those they consider traitors, foreigners they don't like. Um, uh, Urban Kotler, the former justice minister of Canada was himself a victim of uh, similar poisoning, thankfully not as severe, but still while he was on a visit to Russia in the early 2000s. And uh, if we look back, uh, I mean, this was a tool they used back in Soviet days too. Remember in the seventies, the KGB, poisoned, for example, Vladimir Vainovich, a famous Russian dissident writer. They poisoned Georgi Markov, a Bulgarian dissident in London. So they did use that a long time ago, uh, but it was kind of an on and off method. Since Putin came to power, this really became a favorite tool. Uh, and there's a whole slate of names since the early 2000s of people who have been targeted by poisoning. Some were lucky enough to survive like myself, others were not. You know, Yuri Shekhachikhin, 
a prominent invest investigative journalist and uh, an opposition member of parliament was, was killed in 2003 through poisoning. Anna Politkovska was poisoned two years before she would be gunned down. I mentioned Viktor Yushchenko, Alexander Litvinenko, Sergei Skripal, of course, uh, more recently, Erwin Kotler, the former Justice Minister of Canada, Pyotr Verzilov, who is actually a Canadian citizen as well, a Russian Canadian citizen, Russian opposition activist, myself twice, and now today, Alexei Navalny. So again, I hope and pray that's the most important thing now that he pulls out of this. Russia has some of the most amazing doctors in the world. Again, I'm living testimony to that. I would not be here otherwise. The most important thing is that Russian doctors are allowed by Russian authorities to actually do their job. And this is why international spotlight is so important now. Um, on the topic of our uh, discussion today, it's very difficult in our part of Europe, in our part of the world, to disassociate politics and historical memory because, uh, and I think, and I hope Andre will agree with this with regard to Lukashenko, it's certainly true with regard to Putin. Um, they want to control historical memory, no less than they want to control elections or current political life. Both Lukashenko and Putin began with reinstating Soviet state symbols. Lukashenko in 1995 brought back uh, the flag and the national crest of the Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republic. Vladimir Putin in the year 2000 restored the Stalin era Soviet national anthem as a national anthem of the Russian Federation. And that was the, the clearest possible signal uh, of the direction he would take our country. Uh, and symbols very soon turned into substance as uh, Putin's regime uh, cleansed parliament of any real opposition, turned elections into meaningless rituals, tamed the courts, shut down independent media outlets, began imprisoning and yes, killing opponents. Yesterday marked 2000 days since Boris Nemtsov, the leader of the Russian opposition was gunned down directly in front of the Kremlin in Moscow. And to this, to this day, the organizers of his murder continue to be fully shielded and protected uh, from the highest levels of the Russian government. And, uh, you know, this, this uh, domestic situation has very clear repercussions on the international stage. Uh, in Russia, always domestic repression and external aggression were two sides of the same coin. They always went hand in hand. Um, there's no reason, you know, for a regime that tramples on its own citizens and disregards its own laws to respect international norms or the interests of other countries, why would it? And so uh, very quickly we saw this domestic repression under Putin turn into external aggression. Uh, and uh, you know, those Western leaders who for years shut their eyes or preferred to look the other way uh, while Putin shut down independent TV networks in Russia, rigged elections in Russia, jailed opposition leaders in Russia. One day these Western leaders woke up to the first state-to-state -state territorial annexation in Europe since the end of the Second World War, which is what Vladimir Putin did with Crimea in 2014. Those things are interconnected and interrelated. They are also, by the way, interconnected the other way, in a good way. Uh, you know, whenever I'm in Tallinn, uh, which I hope to be again soon once all of this craziness is over, um, I always make a point to go to Nune Street, which is just off uh, the, old, the old town, um, where there is a bar relief that was installed in 2013, uh, funded by Estonian Civil Society, to honor and commemorate Boris Yeltsin, the first uh, and the only elected, democratically elected president of the Russian Federation, to commemorate his role in helping restore the independence of the Baltic states. And I like standing by that barrel leaf um, and watch the reaction from Western tourists, people from Western Europe or Americans, who kind of, and it's, it's the inscriptions in three languages, Russian and Estonian and English. Uh, and so they, they, they look at this, they stop and look, and I see kind of, most of all, I see disbelief on the faces. How is it possible that a Russian president could help a Soviet captive nation achieve independence? Well, you know what? That's what happens when we have a government in Russia that's democratic towards our own people. And that is based on respect, or at least aspires to respect democratic norms, free elections, media, freedom, the rule of law, and so on. And so when that day finally comes, which it will, uh, when Russia has a democratically elected government that will respect the rules and norms of civilized society in our own country at home, this will also have very important positive consequences on international politics. And I think that will be to the benefit of the whole, of the whole world community. And finally, I just want to say that um, too often, far too often, Western politicians and Western journalists and Western NGOs, and this goes for both those who are for Putin and who are against him. Too often, people in the West confuse Russia and the Putin regime. And I'm always grateful to Marcus for never doing that. And there are a few other people who don't, but most people do. I guess it's just shorthand, it's just easy to say Russian aggression, Russian behavior, you know, Russia this, Russia that. It's not Russia. You know, please don't equate a culturally rich, diverse, great nation 
with a kleptocratic, authoritarian, corrupt, criminal regime that misrules it. Those two things are different. And that's, by the way, exactly the same for Belarus. And I'm sure Andre will, will agree with this. Those two things are different. And there are so many people in Russia today, and I know this from my own work and from traveling uh, frequently all over the country, at least I was before this quarantine study, but I hope to resume that again once, once it's finally over. Everywhere I go, and I was just a few months ago before, before this started, I was in uh, Siktivkar, the Republic of Komi. Marcus, I believe you were there as well, um, because it's, uh, uh, they are uh, a people related to the, to, to the Estonian people, I think, right? It's the same group. Um, Finno-Ugric peoples, right, in the Komi Republic. Uh, even the language, you can see it. Uh, so I was in Siktivkar in the, the end of February um, for, my, for my new film screening. I made a documentary recently on somebody who's actually a very prominent figure in the human rights movement in the Soviet Union and now in Russia, an Orthodox, a Russian Orthodox priest. Uh, Father Georgi Edelstein is his name. So I was, I was screening that film and then we had a discussion afterwards. And um, a, a lot of everywhere, you know, in all these events in many, in many places around Russia, it would often be young people who would come to take part in this. And I noticed, and, I, and I've been noticing it for a while, but it, it's really struck me now this time in Siktivkar in February that, um, you know, back some years ago, it would always be possible, and I'm a Muscovite, so maybe there's a bit of a snob, snobbery in here, but, but there's also some, some, some grain of truth. Back a few years ago, you were always able to tell the difference between a provincial audience and the audience, say, from Moscow and St. Petersburg. It would be a different quality of conversation. There are people who talk about different things, ask different questions. That difference is still there for older uh, generations. It's not there anymore for people 30 years uh, of age and younger. And I kind of um, uh, thought to myself as I was speaking to them that, you know, these youngsters who were asking these questions, who were making these comments, who were speaking to me in Siktivkar, they could be, you know, I could be in Moscow or in Petersburg or Novosibirsk because this young generation, it's not that they don't trust Russian state television, they don't watch it. They take their news just as their counterparts in other European countries or here in North America. They take their news from, you know, they read the same Twitter feeds, they watch the same YouTube videos, they use the same social media. It's a whole different generation. They live in a whole different information reality. And that generation, even if you look at the polls recent, uh, um, towards uh, polls that were taking before the recent plebiscite that Putin held to violate the constitutional term limit, also something, by the way, he borrowed from Lukashenko's example. If you look, first of all, overall even, uh, the figures in Russia were split. So all that nonsense about 80 or whatever support percent for Putin, that's just, that has nothing to do with reality. Even, even overall figures were split. And that says a lot in an authoritarian society where many people would be afraid to honestly say that they're against the regime to a pollster, somebody you've never seen before. But even in that condition, it was half-half. So in fact, probably more opposed than support. But if you look at the polls within the young generation, those uh, below 30, you will see massive opposition to Putin and his regime, even in the poll figures. So in reality, it's probably much higher. That is the best hope for Russia. Those are the people we work for. Uh, those are the people who represent the best hope that one day, and I go back to Alexei Navalny because uh, he was asked uh, a few weeks ago, he was doing a radio show on Echo of Moscow. Uh, and he was asking, you know, what are your ambitions? What do you want to happen? And you know, maybe the journalist was expecting some grandstanding or some, some you know, great sounding phrases. Navalny answered very simply. He said, you know, we just want Russia to become a normal European country. And I think I could never put it better than that. And I think that's our main ambition. I have no doubt that one day this goal will be realized. And those young people uh, all over the country um, represent the best hope for that. And we watch with great attention what's happening in Belarus today. And of course, we uh, stand in solidarity and wish all the strength and support to our friends in Belarus who are rising up against the regime of Alexander Lukashenko. Because I mentioned earlier that Putin has been copying a lot of what Lukashenko has been doing with about a four or five year delay, if you look at what's been happening. Uh, but because he came to power five years after Lukashenko, that's, that makes sense. And so a lot of people in Russia today are saying that what's happening in Minsk today we will be seeing on the streets of Russian cities in 2024 when the next Russian presidential election is, is due. And so what happens in, in Belarus in the next few days is obviously very important in itself, but it's also very important for us in Russia for inspiration and solidarity and precedent and example. So I'm honored to share this virtual stage with Andre, um, and I hope to be able to see both Andre and Marcus in real life before too long. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Vladimir. Um, one of the things I'm going to ask you both about once uh, Andre finishes up his introductory remarks is how we can help in the West. What can we do, um, both in, the, in Belarus and, uh, and in Russia? And of course, I, I need to mention the fact that, uh, that Vladimir and I have been working together to honor Boris Nemtsov 
with a street renaming inside Earl Bales Park here in Toronto, which uh, was supported by hundreds of local residents, uh, members of parliament, uh, members of provincial parliament, and of the vast majority of respondents to a recent city of Toronto uh, public consultation. But sadly, the, the effort uh, was rejected uh, last year um, and put on hold due to what seems to be uh, some influence uh, by, uh, by the Russian embassy here in in Ottawa, but so we're going to continue uh, that battle to honor Boris here in Toronto, and um, and I'm. And it's important to say that four world capitals have already done this: uh, yeah. Vilnius, Kiev, uh, Prague, and first and, and foremost Washington D.C. That was the first capital to honor him with street designations. In all of those four capital cities, Russian embassies are now standing on streets and squares and parks named after Boris Nemtsov. And to me, as a Russian citizen, as a Russian politician, there can be nothing more pro-Russian than to have a street in front of the Russian embassy named after a Russian statesman. And I know, the day, I know the day will come when our country will be proud of that. And I hope it will happen in Canada too. And I know Marcus and I will continue these efforts it, it and will. we'll get it done. That's right. Now, over to Andre. Um, looking forward to hearing your remarks about what's going on in Belarus right now and, uh, and your view on that. Thank you, Marcus. Good to see you. Vladimir, hi. Uh, uh, thank you for organizing this, uh, and it takes an Estonian from the Central and Eastern European Council on Canada and Ukrainians from <laughs> Ukrainian Canadian Congress to organize the Molotov Ribbentrop discussion, which is quite important. And I, but first of all, of course, I want, would like to send uh, the best wishes for Alexei Navalny, and uh, we are thinking about him. We. Uh, know him very well, and uh, we, of course, we, a lot of, a lot of worries uh, about his health, about his uh, whole situation. There was a bet, I think, by a Russian journalist who will be the first from pro Kremlin propagandists to say that, but Putin has nothing to gain from it, as was said when uh, Anna Politkovskaya was was killed and. Uh, Predictably, this phrase is already flying from, from behind the Kremlin walls. Uh, I would like to remind, remember the commemoration that we did uh, uh, before the lockdowns uh, last year for the 80th uh, anniversary of, uh, not anniversary, wouldn't call it anniversary in Toronto, which Marcus organized. And I think that we were, all, all of the panelists were quite sounding the alarm bell about what, what's going on in connection with the Molotov-Ribbentrop pact. But we didn't expect uh, that uh, the turn, historic turn that the, for example, the Russian leader has taken with this pact and blaming other countries of uh, signing the similar pacts before uh, Soviet Union. So in other words, uh, putting uh, this uh, secret uh, agreements to divide Europe into the uh, the same category as the uh, legitimate uh, uh, agreements with with uh, to, to, of countries trying to prevent the war, and I think that in general it it, it is uh, something very disturbing that is going on because it's not only that uh, the. Stalin's time and Stalin himself being re rehabilitated and glorified. It is uh, that modern Russian uh, leadership is looking into the Stalin spirit as the source of inspiration for the for 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 today, and is trying to uh, shape the whole system in in Russia according to the Stalin's uh, guidelines. And, and, and that is that is really alarming because it is it is both going on in Russia and in, in Belarus and Lukashenko, their grandsons of Stalin. And uh, I think that uh, it is quite uh, uh, indicative of what what we can expect from both uh, uh, rulers and what uh, what where it could lead us. And speaking of, of today of freedom fight. Uh, it was, I, th I think, what, what is going on in Belarus is uh, something that we predicted that would happen. And we also predicted that uh, uh, the soft position on, on gross human rights violations, soft position of the West, first of all, on uh, which 
for, for a long time tried to ignore the, the, the atrocities that were going on in Belarus uh, and uh, let indirectly or in some cases directly led to the situation today. I agree with Vladimir that semantics are very important. Vladimir said that don't, don't compare Russia and, and, and Putin. I, I would even tell more, start calling spade a spade. There is no authoritarian regime in Belarus. There's a clear dictatorship. And now we see the, all, all the nasty uh, manifestation of this dictatorship because people are being killed and Lukashenko is a murderer today. He is not a soft uh, or, or light uh, authoritarian ruler. He is a dictator uh, who is killing people. And I think we also spoke about it in Toronto last year that uh, the complacency of the West with the criminals who are uh, recognized as legitimate rulers of their countries will lead to international breaches in security, which is which is happening right now, and uh, which uh, Vladimir referred to this annexation of Crimea. And before that, we have to remember Georgia also. So this kind of, uh, you know, re remapping the world in favor of uh, uh, the of the Ill, illegitimate, unlawful rulers of the countries is happening right now before the eyes of, of, of the people in the, and especially of the people in the West, because unfortunately we don't have any leverage on, on the regime inside Belarus. I mean leverage, usual leverage, uh, like independent judiciary. We don't have independent judiciary. We, we cannot, uh, even those people who, who were tortured or killed their relatives cannot go to the court in Belarus, or neither in Russia, and to, to, to seek for justice. The only justice that could come is from the from democratic world. And that's why, the, and today, the democratic world has more tools than before. I'm speaking about Magnitsky Act. Magnitsky Act, which uh, uh, Boris Nemtsov was lobbying and was working and promoting very much. And I think it's uh, one of his. Uh, greatest achievements to, to explain to the, first of all, to the uh, uh, American uh, lawmakers that Magnitsky Act is actually for Russia. And it's, it is directed to support Russia and, and Russian people and Russian uh, uh, demo democracy. So we have more tools today. I mean, the West has more tools and it, it has to be applied. Otherwise we'll be uh, facing more and more dangerous situation. Uh, Marcus asks what, what could be done to help. Don't overlook all these atrocities that are going on now in, in, in Belarus. Don't be shy to call, to, to, to introduce very strict, very strong sanctions against these people. I know that Canada is capable of this, if speak, speaking of Canada. I know that Europe is capable. Of it. But what we, what we see and hear from Europe, for example, and which is alarming, that uh, uh, European Council President Charles Michel uh, is not ashamed to say that he discussed uh, the situation in Belarus with Putin. W what's going on? Uh, we're talking about the independence of Belarus and even Lukashenko was uh, for some time seen as guarantor of independence. And then European leadership is discussing the fate of, of, of the people who are dying now in the streets to, to gain free, freedom, to to go back to normal life, to, 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 to defend their independence with the, the, the person who all these years supported the regime of Lukashenko and without whose support this regime wouldn't survive, wouldn't survive at all. So I think that, that, that these things have to be noticed by all of us and especially by the democratic world because today we, our life is at stake. Life of ordinary people in Belarus and life as, of Belarus as a state is at stake. So I think that uh, I'm, I'm grateful really to Marcus, to Vladimir, because they, they're real friends and they, they, they always uh, are very supportive to our cause. But uh, uh, we need broader solidarity. We need uh, more attention and we need uh, uh, measures that are adequate and not just concerns. Thank you. Well, thank you, Andre. And <clears throat> just going on to Magnitsky sanctions, all three of us have really worked on this campaign to a certain degree, um, whether it's here in, in Canada, elsewhere. Um, and I, 
my sense in, in Canada is that although we've adopted this legislation, we've, we've done the bare minimum of adding uh, the names that were uh, connected to the, the Magnitsky case, uh, uh, a few others, there's a real reluctance to use this tool. Um, I think there's a fear specifically within the uh, Russian context to use it. Um, and, you know, I think we've, the Canadian government over the past uh, 12 months has, has overall demonstrated a bit of a reluctance to go too hard on any of these regimes, including Moscow. And, um, you know, at, at the very least, they've rejected the results in the, the recent um, uh, election. Is there more that we need to be doing? I mean, should we be coordinating these sanctions? Um, you know, I think enforcement is another problem. Um, enforcing these sanctions properly. We have a, an agricultural bank, a Russian agricultural bank here uh, in Canada that's on our sanctions list, but somehow it's managed to be a, uh, become a paying member of a Russia-Canada business association um, without any sort of repercussions. Um, what, what does the sanctions mean? And should we, should we be doing more um, to hold uh, these regimes accountable? Well, first of all, I would say that non-recognition in itself is very important. And Marcus, as somebody from, from a Baltic state, you know how important that is and how that was historically, the Stimson Doctrine and everything, and the Wells Declaration, everything that went with that. Uh, I was very mm -hmm. heartened to see those strong messages of non-recognitions, non-recognition of Lukashenko's quote-unquote victory. Uh, of course, at the emergency EU heads of, heads of state and government summit yesterday, earlier on from the Canadian foreign minister, from the British foreign secretary, uh, of course, from the Baltic states, but that's, that's to be expected. I mean, there's, there are no stronger voices for a rule of law and democracy in European Union in the Baltic states, but even those kind of quote unquote old Western countries have spoken out quite strongly on this. This is encouraging and this is important. As, as Andre said a few minutes ago, let's call a spade a spade. Let's call things for what they are. Lukashenko is not the president of Belarus. He is an illegitimate dictator and should he, he should finally, it's astonishing that we're talking about this after 26 years that he's been in power, but he should finally be recognized as such. Exactly the same goes for Vladimir Putin. I mentioned a few minutes ago this sham plebiscite that Putin held on, on the 1st of July to uh, waive or violate or bypass the constitutional term limits. That was actually a very important turning point in the development of Putin's regime. Uh, in my mind and in the mind of a lot of my colleagues in the Russian opposition, Putin has been illegitimate de facto for a very long time. We know how he prolonged his power. We know the rigged elections and the disqualification of opponents from the ballot and the job swap with Medvedev, who was quote unquote president of Russia. I don't know if anybody still remembers that name. So all of these tricks he used to try to prolong his power up till now, but he was very careful to maintain the appearances. And that's important. He was very careful to pretend to stick to the letter of the law, even as he broke the spirit of the law. What happened on the 1st of July makes a world of difference. For the first time, he broke the letter of the law as well. That constitutional amendment that bypasses Putin's term limits is not just illegitimate, it's actually plainly illegal. Because the way it was done, and I'm not going to go on for this, there have already been actually publications on this, so you can go and, and read if you're interested, and I'll be happy to send links too. Uh, but the, the, it's illegal for two main reasons. The first, first reason is that the constitutional amendments themselves, there is a procedure in Russian law on how to make a constitutional amendment. And it was violated in numerous ways. That's the first thing. And the second and perhaps more important thing, the plebiscite itself was organized in such a way that even all previous elections in Russia under Putin seem like you know, an example of democracy, which of course I don't need to tell you they were not. Because in this plebiscite, every last rule was broken. Uh, it, it, didn't, uh, it didn't correspond in any way possible, for example, to the OSC Copenhagen document, which is kind of the main international framework, at least for those of us who are OSCE members, which goes for Russia, Belarus and Canada, we're all in the OSCE. The OSC Copenhagen documents provides for very clear standards and rules about the election, for example, that there needs to be campaigning allowed on both sides, that there needs to be international or independent observation. None of that uh, happened in Putin's plebiscite. There was a week long early voting, if you can believe that. And every night those ballots were stored, you know, in safes in electoral commission offices with no outside control or oversight. No independent observers were allowed. Political parties were not allowed to send observers. International organizations, including the OSCE, were not allowed to send observers. So the results of this plebiscite had nothing to do with what actually happened at the ballot box. There were two exit polls conducted showed in Moscow and St. Petersburg, a clear majority voted against Putin's amendments. Of course, the official result was overwhelmingly in favor 
Andre will find everything I'm talking about very familiar because they've had it in Belarus for a long time. This is what we had in this plebiscite. And this is important. The reason I spent so much time on this, this plebiscite is a game changer. So Putin has been illegitimate de facto for a while. Now he becomes illegitimate de jure as well. And so when his current presidential term runs out in, what is it, three and a half years time in May of 2024, this is it. And the international community must make clear that this is it. And that there will be non-recognition if he decides to stick and stay in the Kremlin beyond May 2024, just as there was non-recognition of Lukashenko now. And on sanctions, Marcus, you asked about the Magnitsky Act. Uh, first of all, I, uh, and Andre, thank you for referring to that phrase from Boris Nemtsov when he said that Magnitsky law is pro-Russian. He actually said, and I often quote this when I speak at parliamentary hearings and such, uh, Boris said that this is the most pro-Russian law. The Magnitsky Act is the most pro-Russian law ever passed abroad because it's a law that targets those people who abuse the rights of our citizens and who steal the money of our taxpayers. What can be more pro-Russian than that, but to keep those people responsible? The problem is the implementation. Well, first of all, there are only six countries still who have this law, right? So um, Canada, of course, the United States, the United Kingdom, which finally just started implementing it, and the three Baltic states. Uh, and, and this is it. So first of all, it needs to be expanded geographically. There needs to be a Magnitsky Act in the European Union. That's the most important place to have it, no question, for obvious reasons. Uh, but also, even the countries that have it, like the US and Canada and the UK, frankly, they should do a better job of implementing it and raising the level of people. There shouldn't be a glass ceiling that if you're above a certain official position or that if you're close to Putin, you're not going to be sanctioned. That defeats the whole purpose of the, of, of the law. The whole purpose is to go after those high-ranking abusers who enjoy complete impunity and protection at home. Uh, and this largely hasn't been happening yet. There have been some very important moves uh, in the US in the last three years, uh, when the, there were some very high ranking uh, human rights abusers from Putin's regime who have been added on the Magnitsky list. I will name three. Alexander Bastrykin, head of the investigative committee, who has been involved in, in many politically motivated prosecutions of political prisoners and so on, who's also been in, involved in sabotaging the investigation to the murder of Boris Nemtsov. He's been added to the US Magnitsky list. He's the most high profile person on it and the most high ranking Russian government official in it to date. Secondly, Ramzan Kadyrov, of course, that name is very familiar to, to all of our listeners, the, perhaps the most egregious human rights abuser uh, among Russian officials today. He has been added to the list. And last year in May of 2019, so just over a year ago, uh, Major Ruslan Gerimeyev, who is an officer in the Russian Interior Ministry, a close confidant of Kadyrov, who served as one of the low-level organizers of the assassination of Boris Nemtsov, uh, was added by the US government publicly on its Magnitsky list. Uh, and when they did this, the US Treasury actually specified that this guy, Gerimeyev, um, was acting as an agent of or on behalf of Ramzan Kadyrov. They, so in effect, they double designated Kadyrov. And the question I posed and many of my colleagues did publicly after that designation, first of all, we all know how difficult it is to actually get somebody on the Magnitsky list, how many, how much evidence you have to go through, how thorough the kind of the vetting process must be. Um, so after the US government did this and actually specified that this guy, Gary Mayev, was acting on Kadyrov's behalf, the question many of us posed was that if a serving officer in the Russian Interior Ministry and a key confidant of a Kremlin-backed regional leader was a low-level organizer in the assassination of Boris Nemtsov. Who then was the ultimate mastermind? Mm -hmm. well, good question. Um, Andre, how effective, and sorry, Vladimir, you're going to have to leave us. I'll yeah. need to run because of the situation. I just want to make sure to get the maximum attention to what's happening to Alexei, because I know from my own experience that this can, you know, attention can save lives. So um, I thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm, I'm sorry I can't stay longer, but it's, it's a crazy day. So um, I, hope, I hope we'll meet again and, and not just like this, but in real life too. And, and it's always we, great to share the stage with Andre. Thank you so much Vladimir, for joining us. I know how busy your day is. Thanks for taking the time to thank join you, us. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you so much. We'll see you it's soon. wonderful to talk to you. Bye-bye. Bye. Andre, back to sanctions quickly. How effective will sanctions be on the Lukashenko regime if they're not uh, coordinated properly with the EU, with, with uh, the US, Canada, UK, obviously? Um, do you think those sanctions will have a real effect in changing the behavior of the regime? Uh, uh, yes, I, I'm sure about that. And, uh, first of all, we need them immediately because the, the uh, crimes are going on on a regular basis, on a daily basis. 
starting from from uh, end of May, because the, the, the when the candidates started to be arrested, thrown in prison, and then they were tortured there, and then and now that this uh, uh, the behavior of the regime is uh, simply beyond all the international standards. Beyond, I mean, breaking all the international standards, and, and including international obligations of uh, of Belarus as a state. Uh, sanctions are, are, are effective, uh, uh, and uh, yes, there is a question of enforcement, but the, there is also a question of political will. Let me give you one example uh, about Canada. In 2006, when there were sanctions introduced after the yet another fraudulent election and protest and the uh, violence used by Lukashenko regime against peaceful uh, uh, demonstrations, uh, Canada refused the landing of the prime minister of Belarus uh, uh, plane on its territory for refueling that was going on to, uh, to, to, to Cuba. And it, it was, you know, it was uh, some people who were uh, concerned with the situation in Belarus. I think that the uh, foreign minister at that time was Peter McKay and uh, the, the prime minister and the foreign minister, they took a decision and, and denied the, the landing for, for, for the plane. And Canada was not in the forefront of uh, introducing sanctions, but the political will and the uh, real solidarity with the people in Belarus made it possible. And it was a very strong slap on the face for the regime. And they did understand that it is, uh, you cannot be joking with the with the, the democratic world. So, uh, the sanctions are effective when they implemented. The sanctions are effective when they are, are not lifted, because one of the serial criminals of uh, uh, in Belarus is Lydia Irvoshna, who heads the Lukashenko's uh, Central Election Committee for all these years, and who actually. Uh, substituted Viktor Ganchar, uh, not substituted, she was appointed uh, uh, against all laws, even uh, those laws existed at that time in Belarus, to, 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 to take his place. And Viktor Ganchar was later killed by the regime, as you know. So she was under sanctions and she was complaining that she wanted so b badly to go to Paris and to see Paris and she couldn't go there. Then. In, in 2015, European Union uh, suspended sanctions, and in 2016, it lifted sanctions. And, and Yermoshina, the criminal, went immediately went to Paris and went to, uh, to the, on the tour to Italy, and was so happy and was, uh, you know, telling every media in Belarus about how, how happy she was. That was the signal to Belarusians, to the ordinary people that there is impunity for real criminals. And they cannot, you cannot fight. People are fighting today knowing that they are fighting for the just cause. They're fighting for their freedom. They're fighting for their dignity. But when uh, there is no appreciation of this fight uh, outside, and it, even not about appreciation, because ordinary people outside and, uh, do appreciate uh, uh, what, what we are doing. But if there is no, punishment of the criminals from the only uh, community that is able to punish it, democratic community, mostly Western community, then you, you know it's, it's not only problem for, for us, for Belarusians, but also for the world, as I said before, because it is a serious threat to the security. It is serious threat. The regime of Lukashenko is a serious threat to our neighbors, to Ukraine, to Poland, to Baltic states, it is a real threat and it is not a humanitarian threat, it's, it's a military threat as all the major exercises on the territory of Belarus have demonstrated all these years. The, those exercises were possible only because Lukashenko was in power and uh, he, he paid with the, our independence and with our territory to, to, to Kremlin generals who wanted to, 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 to show strength and to demonstrate their aggress aggressiveness was the worst. And if we remember, one of the goals of the first ex major exercise, Zapad uh, 2013, I believe, was the nuclear strikes on Warsaw. And that, that was the plan that was leaked afterwards after the exercise. So simply politicians should, should understand that there is no uh, a separate 
There is, in other words, human rights uh, are directly connected with the hard security. In other words, the soft security is connected with hard, connected with hard security. If you ignore these regimes and behavior of such regimes, you are threatening your own security, even in Canada, because you know Canada is now uh, is now uh, deployed. The Canadian troops are deployed in Baltic states, and uh, they're in danger as well. So I think that the, the world is becoming more and more interconnected, but it cannot handle the 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 atrocities of regimes like Lukashenko. And one one last thing, I was saying it for a long, long time. If you cannot find soft power to deal with petty dictators, you will have no chance against bigger dictators. Good point. And, and this is, these are the things that I've been trying to impress on our government here as well, is that I think Canada, as a defender of human rights, has a real responsibility to help the people of Belarus in any way they can. Sanctions are one of them. We have this tool. The atrocities that we've been seeing over the past two weeks, especially that first week after the, uh, the elections, they were horrific. They were barbaric. What was happening, the, the accounts of what was happening in the prisons in Minsk, uh, rape, uh, the way that batons were being used to choke um, some of the protesters. Um, we can't stand by. We, we have a responsibility to protect the, the human rights situation on the ground and, and the, the protesters. But you bring up a good point, national security. Um, it's in Canada's interest, it's in the West's interest um, to make sure that we secure the, the, the uh, do as much as we can to secure the situation. You know, if it's true that, uh, that Putin's troops are moving into Belarus, if, there, if there's such a situation that, um, that Putin draw, tries to take over a, a part or all of Belarus, there's a serious security implication with the Suwaki gap. There's, this is, and for the, our viewers who don't know, there's a, about a 60 kilometer gap between uh, the border of Belarus and, the, uh, and Kaliningrad. Uh, it's the only land connection for, for NATO to the Baltic states. Um, and this has been uh, identified as experts over the past several uh, years, past decade, as a very, very uh, important and, uh, and uh, an, an area that's at, at serious threat of, of Russian action. So we need to place, it's in our interest, in our own national interest, to place sanctions on these, these rulers uh, against the Lukashenko re regime and his, uh, his officials. Now, I'm going to go to a quick question online. This is from Peter and Natalia in Ottawa. And uh, Andre, the question is, uh, what is your thought about the absence of real and strong leadership and plans in the current situation in Belarus? I think they were referring perhaps to the opposition and the decentralized uh, nature of that opposition. Um, some leaders are in prison, some are abroad. How, are, how do you see things moving forward in this case with, uh, with this decentralized opposition that we're seeing right now in Belarus? Yes, it is uh, true, but the, the things are moving on, protests are continuing, the strikes has uh, started. It's, uh, you know, uh, uh, when Nelson Mandela was in prison over the question that uh, the, the protest movement was without leadership, when, when Václav Havel or Lech Valencia were in prison, for different terms, nobody questioned the, that there was, uh, nobody put this question that there was no leadership. Yes, we, we do have leaders in, in, in prison today, especially those leaders who are known to be uh, leaders of, of uh, protests and uh, strong leaders against this regime like Nikolai Statkevich and Pavel Severinins and uh, then recently uh, Sergei Tikhanovsky and uh, Viktor Babareka. And uh, one of the demands, one of the strong demands from, from the people protests uh, is to release this political prisoner. So I think that even being, even in jail, they're uniting people. Even in jail, people, they, 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 they are leaders and they're symbols because people do understand that they, 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 without their release, uh, it will be probably less, it will be more difficult to achieve the results. So uh, I, I don't see a, a serious problem here because we do have leaders. And, uh, and besides we are having more and more leaders who were previously unknown, uh, who are 
capable of self-organizing. I mean, the, the, the groups that are capable of self-organizing and helping people. And uh, I'm, I'm really happy to see new faces today leading the protests. So looking at the time, one final question from me then. Um, where do you see things going? We saw that uh, Lukashenko, was it yesterday, the day before, um, said he's ordering a new crackdown on the protesters. How long can he, how long will, will the, the people of Belarus um, be able to protest under these sorts of conditions? How far will Lukashenko go? And, you know, is there, is there an end to this? Will he be, will he be effect, will he effectively suppress the, the protest movement, the pro-democracy movement, as we're seeing it right now? Where, where do you think this is going? I, I think he's finished, even if he managed to stop the process, protests and stifle the protest, uh, I think he's finished because it's, it's simply impossible. He, he did some, some uh, uh, unbelievable, he achieved something unbelievable. He managed to offend every, every Belarusian during the pandemic, everyone, and I believe even his own people, because his behavior during the pandemic is, was the red line. For, for the people in Belarus, that's why you saw such a mess, you are seeing such a mess protest today. And, and he continued to cross these uh, red lines and he, he's cr crossing them. I think that, uh, I, I, I forgot to mention one very important fact. Uh, when people compare the situation in Belarus with the revolution in, in Ukraine, uh, they compare, the, the comparison is, uh, uh, justifiable and not, because uh, very interesting, there is no Russian factor in Belarus protest at all. There is no, nobody, the only thing, the only uh, player who wants to introduce Russian factor is Lukashenko. He is trying to involve Putin, he is trying to say that the protesters are anti-Russian, no. Uh, they, they even, they, there was even sympathy expressed towards Russian and Russian people and uh, absolutely no animosity among the people. They, 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 they hate Lukashenko. They, they, they are very getting more and more angry, angry with him. They want to get rid of him. So all the speculations about Putin moves, next moves, very grounded. I, 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 yes, I do. I, I do agree because you never know what Kremlin would uh, do the, the, the next time, the next day. But uh, it will be so obvious that it, it will be unwarranted. It will be unjustified. It will be without any even artificial arguments uh, or, or any artificial pretext. And uh, how how for how long Lukashenko will? Uh, Staying there in Belarus and continue with his uh, brutality also de depends on all of us, on Belarusians and also on the international community, because soft measures, as we agreed, uh, soft measures uh, against taken against dictators or statements, uh, expression of consent will not help us. And the first violence has to have to be stopped and sanctions will definitely help to stop the violence in the street. And the violence is coming only for Lukashenko, you see it. I'm, I'm some, sometimes, you know, it's, it's very painful to see how Belarusians, how peaceful Belarusians are, even when they're killed, even when they're being beaten, even when they're being tortured. So it has to be stopped. And uh, I think that uh, inside the country, there are efforts to stop this violence, but uh, there have to be matching efforts or stronger efforts from outside. So I do hope that uh, Belarus is on the right path of becoming democratic and independent. But uh, the, the moment is quite uh, precarious and uh, solidarity is needed. That's uh, our usual message, but uh, you, Marcus, understand it better than anyone. Well, and I think one of the things that has struck every Canadian who's, if you've watched any of the images coming through social media, Nexta, uh, Belsat, is the peaceful nature of these protests mm -hmm. and the disproportionately violent reaction of that regime. It's, it's shocking. Um, I mean, it's, it's truly emotional wa watching some of those images. And 
and my real hope is, is that there is some way you know, that Canada will work with its EU partners, with the US, with the UK to coordinate those sanctions. And not just coordinate those sanctions, but look for other ways that we can help Belarusian civil society, how we can help diaspora groups. I mean, one of the things that I think that the uh, our Ukrainian brothers and sisters, um, one of the biggest things that they had going on in during Maidan was a strong diaspora community that kept um, those issues on the national media radar in, in the eye of the politicians. And whatever we can do as Central and Eastern Europeans uh, to help the Belarusian diaspora and civil society, you know, we'll, we'll try and continue to do that. And uh, you know, any other measures as well. Uh, one of the things that uh, I was struck by was the fact that the internet was completely shut down in Belarus for days on end. This is, this is something, something that we can help with in the West. Um, there are measures that we can take. There are new technologies out, uh, whether it's Elon Musk's new system, uh, broadband uh, low orbit internet uh, satellites, uh, long range uh, Wi-Fi transponders. These are things that I think we, can, we need to do right now to help Belarus. And we can use these same measures to help uh, in other situations um, in, at other times. But there's a lot of work to be done and, um, and Andre, I don't know if you have any last thoughts that you'd like to give um, before we, we close off this session. No, it's, it's simply, the, the, again, I would like to repeat the message that uh, Belarus is worth, worth uh, uh, fighting for, uh, worth helping. And everything you said about helping the uh, uh, civil society, especially very important, uh, helping with technologies, with new technologies and uh, trying to uh, involve uh, major IT companies in in the uh, in the situation in Belarus, so that they would not help the dictators, but help the people and uh, with their capabilities. Like I mean, like Facebook, like Google, like Twitter, that would would all always helpful. And I think that Belarus is also very very in very let's say promising case for the future of democracy in the world, because as we know. The Freedom House uh, classification is uh, uh, is really depressing because more and more countries are listed as non-democratic, and we have to reverse we have to reverse this tendency. And Belarus might be the case that will serve this purpose. Well, we can only keep our fingers crossed, and we'll do all we can here. And that I can promise uh, to to help that along. Um, thank you, sir, uh, for your friendship. Um, and for your brave efforts um, all of these years. Um, I sincerely hope that you can return to your home um, in the coming weeks and continue the fight there. Um, and like I said, if there's anything that we can do to help you, you, you know where to reach us. We'll do all that we can from here. Um, and uh, you know, we're, 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 we're gonna help fight for that with freedom for Belarus uh, as long as it takes. Um, so keep up the good fight, my friend. And thank, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for this event. And thank you for everyone for tuning in today uh, for this Black Ribbon Day 81st anniversary uh, uh, seminar. Thanks for watching, um, and we'll see you next year.